today I'm going to I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview style talk, but I'm going to go into some of the details of the problems that I think are sort of what we're facing in the field right now and what we're interested uh, in going forward. So, um, and it's it's meant to provoke you know discussion and also to hopefully um, have a glimpse at you know what's next for CryoVM because I think there is a lot to go um, next in CryoVM. So, all right, so let's get into it. Um, of course, you know, part of the reason why we're all here is that, you know, single par particle cryo EM is a great success story and um, we really are entering this, this age of plenty in terms of structure determination by cryo EM. So this is one way to, um, to characterize that and lots of people have done plots like this, but this one is um, the one I like to show which was done by uh, Richard Henderson. So this is the total number of uh, PDB depositions by three different methods. Um, uh, X-ray, electron microscopy, and NMR, all the way back to 1997. So this is the number of atomic structures deposited uh, by year, all the way up to, it looks like I last updated this in April, but um, it's following this exact same trend so far. Um, this is X-ray, this is electron microscopy, and this is NMR. And you can see that, you know, X-ray had a, had a very rapid rise. Uh, especially with the advent of synchrotrons and cryocooling and lots of new technology, <clears throat> and now has sort of um, started to plateau. And EM, of course, was almost nothing in the early days, and, uh, and now with the advent of a lot of new technology um, around 2012 or 2013, entered an exponential phase of, of growth. And there are no signs of that exponential slowing down, even um, right up till now. Um, and NMR sort of uh, peaked... Um, uh, around the mid-2000s, and, and now is mostly being used for other things, actually. So, um, and the plot we like to show for this, since we're in a mass institute, let's, put, let's show some plots, right? Um, is the ratio of the number of structures determined by X-ray to the number of structures determined by EM. And you can see, you know, ratios are... Um, pretty high when uh, your, uh, your denominator is tiny. But then uh, when EM entered this exponential phase, you can see it's, it's, it's uh, beautifully linear here. And as far as we can tell, there is no reason why this isn't um, going to reach parity um, in 2024. So this is a real triumph for the field, actually, that you know, um, there will be as many structures determined with electron microscopes as there are with all the synchrotrons of the world. So I think you know, there's at least some people in the front row of this audience that thought that would never happen or might you know, have been amazed for, to ever see that happen. But I think we, we are seeing that. Another way to look at this is here. So this is uh, just a collection of structures that we put in a recent review paper um, uh, we wrote. Um, all of these uh, structures were determined uh, in a single uh, week uh, this year. Um, and uh, if you look at the number of entries in the electron microscopy data bank, you can see that's also in an exponential growth phase, such that you know, um, within a decade, we're going to have more than 100,000 structures in this, um, in this data bank. And so you know, it, it's not unreasonable to, to stop at this point and, just, and think about what, what is next for single particle cryo-EM and what is next for cryo-EM in general um, in the context of this sort of golden age of plenty. And what's also going to keep that exponential going, right? Because it's, um, it's not so easy to keep a Moore's Law type behavior uh, going for a long period of time. So one thing that I think is next is um, the advent of these new uh, specimen supports. So um, Katerina Nydanova, a postdoc, um, working with me now, um, is going to give a talk later about this today. So I'm not going to discuss it much, but I think this has the potential to increase both the quality and quantity of data we can get from, from any electron microscope. So I think this is going to be quite important to, to pushing um, both the, um, the, the resolution and quality of the maps, but also the number of structures that we can determine. Um, so she'll talk about that later today. Um, but there are other things we're working on, and one of them came out of this sort of long-term study of exactly what is the best energy to be doing this microscopy at. You know, we have electron microscopes. We can turn a knob on the voltage and decide whether we want to go to high energy, to low energy, to middle energy, but, you know, there, there ought to be a, a, a proper physical uh, reason for doing so. And, um, and so we sort of went back to basics uh, in terms of first principles of uh, electron scattering with specimens. So we, we published this paper back in 2019, um, which compared the cross sections, the inelastic and elastic scattering cross sections, which you can see plotted here. Um, 
And uh, in fact, if you do compare these two and take them as a metric for uh, radiation damage in the case of inelastic scattering and signal uh, in the case of elastic scattering, um, you see that to first approximation with energy, they scale together, uh, particularly in the range that you know, we're interested in for electron microscopy. Um, but as you delve into the details, you find that they don't actually scale perfectly together. And this means that there, um, there is uh, the opportunity to get more signal per unit damage by going to lower energies. But you have to take into account the fact that um, there are other effects that come into play if you go to too low of an energy. And the main one that we have to worry about is multiple scattering. So once the, the uh, elastic scattering happens multiple times within the specimen, then you lose the phase information and you can no longer um, use it to generate signal in your images. So, um, so we tried to uh, take all this in, into account in this sort of simple formulation here, which has an optimum per unit thickness uh, of, of ice. And so you can see here for a 300 angstrom thick ice layer, there is an optimum around um, 100 kV, which was a big surprise because, you know, most of our microscopes that are doing, 300, uh, doing single particle imaging are all working at 300 um, kV. And uh, it turns out that there is a, a potential improvement in just in pure signal, not taking anything else into account. Um, by lowering the energy uh, of the beam. But of course, you do have to take all the other things into account. And we did and published several papers on all the details, like other phenomena that you worry about, like charging and, um, uh, and, and movement and other things. Um, and in the end, we, um, we published a paper where we had cobbled together a microscope out of sort of old parts in the lab and uh, ran it for one week. And we, we solved five structures in one week. So this was an old F20, 17 years old. Um, with an x-ray detector um, that we uh, strapped onto the bottom and um, old side entry holders and, and we still were able to determine all these structures in, in one week's time. And so we were, we were quite convinced we hadn't missed anything there and now we um, uh, instituted a, a, or initiated a project to develop a whole new um, cryo-EM platform at 100 kV. Um, and this is, um, this is the first prototype that's in our Cambridge lab now. Um, it's assembled from a, a new field emission gun, which has been developed by our colleagues in York, uh, York Probe Sources. Um, and this is a Joel 1400 column that has been slightly modified to have the properties we want in terms of imaging quality. And then there is a, one of these direct detectors from Dectris. This is a Dectris Singla. On, on the bottom of it. And um, altogether, we've now got this running and we'll soon be collecting data sets um, in Cambridge. Uh, and right alongside this microscope, if this photo extended, you'd see there was also a Thermo Fisher Tundra sitting right there. So um, Thermo Fisher has not uh, ignored this uh, either and have, have now uh, also developed um, a microscope at 100 kV. So, um, so I think this is exciting because it's going to both reduce the cost of cryo-EM and also potentially improve the signal in all of the images. So it's not often that you can actually get you know, things that are cheaper and better at the same time. So I think this is one of those times. And, um, but one of the key things to, to make this happen is going to be the development of detectors because de dedicated direct electron detectors have not been developed for 100 kV previously. And um, they were really all designed for 300 kV, as you can see here. So this is sort of a table which includes um, all of the uh, um, 300 kV detectors that are commercially available with um, some sort of limited amount of information about how good they are. So, you know, from film um, to the sort of modern generation of direct electron detectors, um, there should be a line um, for DE here as well. Apologies for that. Um, and then, you know, future CMOS detectors will get better. There is, you know, there, there isn't a limit to this. Um, they will get bigger and faster and still continue to improve. Although probably not at the sort of quantum leaps that we had when these first came out compared to, say, film or CMOS detectors. But at 100 kV, these are really the only options right now. Um, and um, the Tundra is going to come with a phosphor-coupled uh, CMOS detector. Um, we're using the Stectris uh, Singla. Um, on, uh, for our project, um, but there are now um, at least uh, four or five um, funded projects to develop new detectors at 100 kV. Some of them have now been announced. Gatan has announced their Alpine detector. Um, there's a detector that's been funded, a project that's been funded by Horizon uh, 2020, which is in collaboration with uh, Thermo Fisher and, and us, um, but it being led by Imicenic, which is a detector development company in Barcelona. Um, 
There's another um, detector being funded by the Rosalind Franklin Institute, uh, which is uh, outside of Oxford, but being developed by the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory and STFC there um, called the C100. This has also been announced and, um, uh, and is now commercially available. Uh, and then there's Dectrisis Singla, which is already on the mar market and you know, we are using, and then they have um, uh, you know, future uh, plans for new ones as well. Um, so, uh, you know, this technology development and even, you know, having lots of technologies being developed is actually very good for all of us in the field, I think, and, it's, and it, um, it shows that, you know, we're not done yet. Now, we, we recently published another paper which offers the opportunity for improving single particle yet some more, uh, but we're not there yet. So, um, in this paper, which we published uh, quite recently. This was actually the result of a very long-term study in collaboration with um, Yoshi Fujiyoshi's group in Japan where we made comparisons of liquid nitrogen and liquid helium radiation damage. Um, and we found that in every single case, uh, for the for 2D crystals anyway, um, and to, we use 2D crystals of uh, bacteria rhodopsin and um, uh, aquaporin, and we sent we made specimens in Cambridge and sent them uh, to Japan. They made specimens in Japan and sent them to us, and we collected data on both of our microscopes, which are completely different. And in every single case, we we did see an improvement in radiation damage. So this is not something we would want to leave behind. However, there are other factors to consider um, in lowering the temperature because by lowering the temperature we're, we're not just changing one thing you change a lot of things actually you potentially change a lot of things and people have of course tried to do this in the past and have um, for pretty good reasons given up um, so there are many studies looking at the movement and buckling of the ice films at lower temperatures and um, and many other things. Um, and I think the, the paper that got the farthest is this one from Werner Kohlbrandt's lab that was published fairly recently. Olivia Field Gardner there um, led this study where she collected a data set of apoferritin at, um, at nitrogen temperatures and at liquid helium temperatures. And essentially she found with a, roughly the same amount of data um, that there was no difference um, in the resolution of the structure between the two. And this is often how these um, experiments have been done in the past, these sort of comparative studies where they attempt to, you know, see is it better or worse. But unfortunately, because we're changing many things when we lower the temperature or potentially changing one, many things, this doesn't always give you enough insight to figure out what's going on. But they did study the movement um, of the particles um, in these two data sets. And they found that the, the particles um, at liquid helium temperatures were moving significantly more than the ones at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So the, the hypothesis in this, uh, at, or the conclusion if you will, was that um, perhaps the data was better at liquid helium temperatures but the increased movement at lower temperatures actually um, compensated for that improvement in signal and so then it was a wash which is why they didn't see uh, a specific benefit. But I think we need to delve significantly deeper into this and understand it. Um, you know, is the movement really better? Are there other things going on? And can we recover this uh, improvement in radiation damage which we are now pretty confident is there? Um, just to show you why we're so confident that it's there, this is the actual diffraction patterns from that, um, from that study. So here is, you know, a, a, I'll, um, sorry, the contrast isn't perfect on this screen, but um, this is um, a crystal of purple membrane, and uh, we've done a dose series here um, to show the spots fading, and this is the comparative uh, at 13 Kelvin, and you can see um, there is really a significant difference, and if you do <laughs> dozens and dozens of these crystals like we have, you'll realize that, you know, there is something going on here, and we cannot, um, we cannot leave this behind, I think. But it is complicated, so I'll show you another couple movies which sort of um, show why this is such a complicated question. So here I'm looking at a single particle specimen now. These are hepatitis B viral capsids at um, 80 Kelvin and these are at uh, 14 Kelvin. And I'll start the 80 Kelvin movie first. So here we're giving much higher doses. So well beyond what you would give, you know, in your normal single particle image. And you can see this, the formation of these little bubbles here, which were fairly um, conclusively uh, determined to be hydrogen by, by Leitman many years ago. Um, by eel spectroscopy. Um, and so you see, uh, you know, at high doses eventually you generate enough hydrogen to nucleate a bubble and it starts to get larger. But then in um, the same conditions at liquid helium temperatures, you can see there's a vastly different phenomenon happening where you see bubbles 
all over the place. And somehow these bubbles know where those viral capsids were. So this is quite a striking thing, right? So there is, you know, some significant changes in the physics going on here. And it's not going to be as simple as a one-for-one -one thing to figure this out, I think. So we have to, we have to get deep into the details of this and we're, you know, we're, we're game to do it, but we're certainly not there yet. So in order to sort of unlock the potential of reduced radiation damage at liquid helium temperatures, we're going to have to figure out what's going on here. And if it's a, if there are showstoppers, if there are proper roadblocks, then we have to either work out ways around them or, you know, come up with some other creative thing. But I think um, we need a bit um, stronger understanding of the physics of what's going on before we're gonna, gonna be able to do that. But if we sum all this up, um, the potential for improving single particle images, so I just show a micrograph here, one of my favorite micrographs from Jacques Duboucher from some uh, close to 40 years ago, um, where you could really see the potential of cryo-EM and many of the problems. Um, but, you know, this is where we were, um, you know, imaging, uh, bacteriodopsin crystals or, or, you know, other 2D crystals at 100 kV with a tungsten source and, um, and room temperature. So the biggest factor of improvement comes from cooling to liquid nitrogen. This is the cryoprotection factor, right? This is why we do cryo. Um, and then, uh, you know, going down to 100 kV should get us another a uh, bit of improvement in signal to noise um, and adding, you know, liquid helium, 100 kV, new grids, reduced movement, all of these things, um, and possibly even reducing energy spread. You know, we're, we're sort of, we're only about halfway to the, <laughs> to the limits even as we know them now. So, um, so I think there is still a lot of improvement for single particle and we wouldn't leave any of this behind if we, if we don't have to. Okay, let's switch gears now and talk about what I put in the title of the talk, which is identifying molecules in situ. So what do we mean by this? Well, you know, structures don't exist in a vacuum, right? They exist uh, inside cells. And, and you know, and, and the very interesting bits of biology that we want to understand come from looking at these structures inside cells and their interaction. And uh, there's certainly a lot of problems that are only going to be solved by being able to see what these things are doing. And, um, of course, people have been working on this for a very long time. And this is... Um, one of the best tomograms I've seen, certainly better than anything we've ever done, um, from the Baumeister lab. Um, so this is a mouse um, retina. Um, this is a fib milled section out of the retina and you can see the beautiful membranes inside here and you can see these sort of individual proteins sort of sticking in the membrane. And, you know, and it's an, it's an amazing thing, um, but it also highlights sort of where the problems are as well, if you look carefully at this at this uh, tomogram. And uh, especially if you look at it in cross-section, you can see, first of all, there are um, damage layers that are present on both sides of the lamella. You can only see it on one side here because there's been a, a smattering of, of uh, metal particles put on the surface. So you can see there's some 300 angstroms of completely destroyed material in between where the surface of the, um, the ion beam stopped milling and where the actual bit where you can see contrast is. So this is serious because, you know, it's a major effect. Uh, and it's on both sides of every fib milled lamella that we have. And right now, the, we don't have any technique that doesn't somehow damage the surfaces um, of these uh, thin specimens. And we certainly can't have too thick a specimen because then, you know, we run into all kinds of problems of multiple scattering and uh, you, you, you sort of hit the walls that are uh, in that plot from, from Pete et al. I showed earlier. Um, and then there's even other problems like curtaining and how to get contrast, how to stop charging. There's movement in these specimens that's totally uncharacterized. Um, so there's all kinds of problems yet. So, you know, the, the, meant, the idea here is that it's meant to be provocative in the sense that, you know, are we standing on top of the mountain and this is as good as tomography is ever going to get? Or, you know, is there another peak higher up? Can we get further, actually? Can we, can we really improve this even more? And um, so the way we decided to approach this from a, from a theoretical perspective is, is using essentially the same type of analysis that Richard Henderson did in this famous paper um, from 2005. Sorry, the top is clipped off. Um, at where he, where he um, you know, famously predicted, I think most people know about this paper because he said electrons were the way to go, not x-rays, right? He looked at electrons, x-rays, and neutrons for doing structural biology. Um, but also inside this paper, he's, he made this quite 
uh, interesting prediction that if we could fix all of the technology and, and you know, sort out all the problems in cryo-EM, like the detectors and the voltage and the you know, various things that were all wrong, eventually we'd be able to do sort of sub-50 kilodalton proteins. Um, you know, or even, even 38 kilodaltons is the, is the number that he, he came up with eventually. That's this possibly down here. And so um, what we've done um, with a PhD student in my lab, Josh Dickerson, um, is to repeat this analysis now, but here extending it um, as a function of specimen thickness. So on the, on the bottom axis here, and I'm going to go through this plot in detail, this is the thickness of specimen, and on the, the y-axis here we have the minimum molecular mass in kilodaltons of a protein that you can actually identify and therefore align to do single particle analysis or equivalently, you know, do sub averaging on or template matching on, or, you know, these are all very similar type operations. Um, but they all come down to the signal to noise that you can achieve in a particular image, single section image or in a tilted image but um, uh, this is dependent on the thickness of the of the specimen you uh, you have of course uh, and uh, and this is sort of the single particle limit that Richard predicted in that in that 95 paper um, and so our number is 42 instead of 38 but it's essentially the same um, so now if we do extend that with um, with current technology, this is what we should be able to do. So 300 keV energy filters, the sort of what you know what you would buy from a microscope company today. Um, you'd see a scaling like this, and it's a bit depressing, quite honestly, because you can see you know you're in the single particle range here, but as soon as you get out to three three thousand four thousand angstroms, so you know 300 or 400 nanometers, which is what these fib milled sections we have are you're already up here into the sort of close to a megadalton range, right? Um, but uh, unfortunately, it's even worse than that because this is where we actually are in practice right now. Um, if you look in subtomogram averaging or in papers where people are looking to identify individual particles, you know, the vast majority of them are actually ribosomes, which are kind of off the scale here even. Um, but even for, you know, for smaller proteins, uh, this, is, this is about the best we're doing right now. So, you know, the first question we wanted to ask is what's separating us from, from this limit? I mean, we, we know experimentally now that this limit is true, right? We can do proteins down in the 50 kilodalton range and as things get a little bit better, we're gonna push it even further, um, you know, down into the 40 and 30s. But, um, so, you know, I, I, I'm pretty confident in this. And, but, you know, why is it we're so far away in tomography here? Well, it's, it's the things I showed you in that first plot. So one big thing is this damage caused by fib milling. You know, if you have, let's say you had a thousand angstrom thick section and you have a thousand angstroms of damage total on each side, well, that's a factor of two in thickness. That's a major thing, right? That's not something um, that you can just ignore and pretend isn't there. That's gonna, you know, have a very significant effect on the amount of signal you get in your images. Um, and so, you know, this sort of dream of Jacques Dubochet of being able to just take a slice uh, cell and slice it up like a salami and lay it onto a grid, we still don't have this, right? We, we, and we want it. So I don't think we should stop thinking about ways to do this and try and push this as far as possible. And, you know, it's, it's clear that, you know, cutting with a cold knife, it, you know, you can do it. And, and Jacques Dubochet was the first really to push on this, but it also has lots of problems with compression artifacts and other things. But, you know, I don't think we should give up on technology development for specimen preparation here, um, just because you can buy a fib sem. I think there's, you know, quite a bit more potential there to improve. And then the second thing is that I'm, I'm sure people who do demography already know, but, um, but uh, you know, this needs to be made more clear as well, is that the, the specimen moves a lot while you image it. And there's lots of software that's been developed in order to try and compensate for the movement and track it. But really we need to understand where it comes from and hopefully we can have a solution like we have achieved for single particle where you can actually just get rid of it entirely. And so that's also an exciting frontier um, that needs to be explored. And then the third thing I think that's separating us um, from, uh, uh, from, you know, perfection, as it were, in uh, achieving what we should be able to do, even with our current microscopes, um, is the algorithms. These must have lots of room for improvement because we, uh, and, you know, we'll hear from 
um, from Nico on the, the latest state of the art in trying to actually detect particles in these two images, and we're big fans of all this work. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement in the algorithm side of things as well to try and actually find uh, a particular molecule within this milieu of thousands of other molecules and noisy signal, or uh, well, signal in noise, as it were. Right. So, so I think you know there is quite a lot that can be done just to get us up to what you know is available from current um, microscopes. But can we actually do anything more about the microscope itself? I think the answer is yes. And here's why. So right now, you know, you can you can buy a um, a, a lovely uh, Titan Cryos, which uh, has these beautiful purple lights on the outside, and inside of it you have this sort of state-of-the-art energy filter, and for, you know, several millions of pounds you can have all of this in, in your lab right today, and you might ask yourself, what is it do you, you pay for when you buy one of these filters? Well, the answer is you pay to remove electrons, right? You're trying to filter out, you're trying to remove all these inelastic electrons that are supposedly giving you noise in your images, right? Well, let's look at these electrons. These are electrons that have lost energy. So in this case, we've put a platinum nanoparticle on the surface of um, a carbon uh, um, substrate that's roughly equivalent to 400 nanometers of ice. So approximately like having, you know, one of these tomography specimens. And then we've retuned the filter here such that we're only looking at the 23 eV electrons, the ones that everybody throws away, that you pay millions of dollars to throw away. And you can see that there's beautiful signal in all of these electrons. These inelastic electrons are not um, rubbish. We just don't have a way of capturing them in our images. And the reason we don't have a way of capturing them in our images, and the reason we do throw these away now, is of course chromatic aberration. So the objective lens of an electron microscope uh, has significant amounts of chromatic aberration, which means that uh, electrons that uh, have higher energy are not focused into the same plane as electrons that uh, uh, have exactly the same energy as the primary beam. And so these perfectly good electrons, which have lots of signal in them, are uh, not focused properly in your image, so therefore you cannot um, use them for your phase contrast signal. But there is uh, an optical device, which has been around in the material science community for quite some time, um, to actually correct the chromatic aberration of an electron lens. And you can see one here. It's a, it's a fairly big, complicated device, um, but uh, it, it does exist, and there have been many of these made in the past uh, and used. And we went and used one in uh, ULIC to do a lot of the studies I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, and now there has been one ordered um, uh, by Pei Wang at Sustec in... Um, in Shenzhen, uh, which actually is a, uh, attached to a cryo microscope. So this is a proper cryo microscope, not a material science microscope, but has a CC corrector on it and has just been um, installed there. So um, we're kind of excited about this because we want to see what, what would happen if we brought the signal back from these images instead of just throwing it away as we're doing now. Um, but, uh, but there is a problem, and I'll show you what the problem is. So the problem is that um, you cannot go to any defocus you want using um, using electrons that have lost inelastic energy. So um, if we work at our standard imaging conditions with one of these CC correctors, uh, we can do about half a micron of defocus or so. And uh, that would be sort of the lower limit where you can still get phase contrast signal in the normal way that we do it now. So that's, that is a benefit, but it's, um, it's not uh, as much as we would like it to be. And I'll show you why that is. And I'm just going to give one simple slide because in the interest of time, I won't go into all the details, but feel free to ask me about them later. Um, and that is that one, when the electron beam comes from the source, it's beautifully coherent, both in space and time. So the wave front is uniform all the way across. But when it goes through the specimen, it gets scattered, and um, the elastic scattering events don't change things much, and you can then have the waves interfere with each other, and then that gives you your phase contrast. And the same is true for the inelastic electrons, the ones that have suffered some sort of energy loss event within the specimen. Unfortunately, that energy loss event is always associated with a change in direction as well. So essentially, they lose a certain amount of their spatial coherence 
from the inelastic event. They're still perfectly good electrons. They can still interfere and cause phase contrast, but they're not as spatially coherent. And that's what I'm trying to show here um, in this slide. So, uh, and, and the bottom line is that uh, putting your electron beam through, say, a 400, angst or a 400 nanometer thick specimen is like taking your source and changing it from a field emission gun to a tungsten source. So you've decohered it. And so what's the implications of that? So, you know, on the bottom here, this is angular spread, right? So this is the angular spread of a FEG, and this is the angular spread of a tungsten source, this W here. And so by, by putting these uh, electrons through the specimen and having them all lose some certain amount of energy around, you know, 23 EV, you shift that energy distribution, that angular distribution to one that would be something more like a tungsten source. And what that means is you can't have the same level of phase coherence at very high defocus that we had, you know, in our normal imaging conditions where we're only looking at the zero loss electrons. And so we're gonna have to work close to focus if we really wanna get all these electrons back. Now, um, I'm gonna do a short aside here because there is an important detail in the, in the sort of theoretical side of the literature which has to be addressed. And um, we didn't wanna leave this out because I think it's quite, Im quite important, although you know, in, in the broad context of development, it's probably gonna be like a footnote. But there, there is this controversy, uh, at least in the, the physics side of electron microscopy, about whether or not there is a top-bottom effect in phase contrast with inelastic electrons. And this is sort of for the specialist, but in the end, it's a simple, simple idea is that, you know, if you have a particle at the top of your thick specimen and you have a particle at the bottom of your thick specimen, or you have a particle in the middle of your thick specimen, does the inelastic uh, phase, does the phase contrast from um, the inelastically scattered electrons, is it the same on the top and the bottom? Seems like a simple question, right? But it's actually controversial. And there are papers in the literature which uh, say completely opposite things. And this is not something we can, you know, sort of be ambiguous on because if we're gonna spend millions developing new microscopes and you can, uh, for example, not get any contrast out of the top of the specimen, then this is, you know, a real problem. But, so let's look to the literature. You know, people have been using electron microscopes for a long time. Um, surely there's some theory on this. And of course there is, so um, to, you know, titans of our field in terms of electron microscope theory. So this is Archie Howey in Cambridge. Um, and he, he basically said, no, there is no top bottom effect. And the simple way of understanding is from figure four of this, this paper he published. Um, and that, uh, you know, the, the elastic events uh, are just as good if they happen on an electron that has also inelastically scattered as if it hadn't uh, inelastic, uh, had not inelastically scattered. Um, and then Harold Rosa has a very similar conclusion soon afterwards, and you can sort of read his, uh, his discussion of it here in this paper. So, you know, back in the 70s, they thought about this carefully and, you know, said, no, no problem. Inelastic electrons are just as good as any other electrons. Um, but more recently, there have been papers published which seem to contradict this, um, essentially concluding that only uh, phase contrast from the top of the specimen uh, will be good, and the bottom of the specimen, it will lose all of, all of uh, the coherent information. And conversely, there's a paper that says exactly the opposite, that only the particles at the bottom, where the wave is just coming out of the specimen, are gonna be good, and the ones at the top are gonna be all lost. Okay, well, come on, this is, you know, we're physicists here, we gotta sort this out. So, you know, so Howie in 62 says no, Harold Rosa says no. Howie actually, Archie published another paper in 1979, and you can, if you read through the lines, you can see he's really, he's kind of annoyed with the field for not paying attention to the one he published in 62. But, you know, like seriously pay attention. And then some, you know, many years later, now this has all gotten re, dug up in, in controversy again. So we thought, okay, this needs a proper experiment to sort of resolve the facts, right? And so this is the experiment we decided to do. We took um, uh, nanoparticles and put them on the top surface of a thick layer of carbon, which is very similar, you know, similar scattering proper, properties to, um, to what you would have uh, 
with, uh, with ice, but in this case, we also had aluminum. And the reason we put aluminum in is it has a very strong plasmon peak, so you can get an awful lot of inelastic electrons. So you get a big, uh, a big signal from them. And we put particles on the top of the specimen and on the bottom of the specimen. And then you can see the diffracted beams here um, in the Fourier transform, and we measured um, you know, the power in these Fourier transforms. And in the end, you find that for particles on the top, you get a number that looks like this, and a, for 92 particles on the bottom of the specimen, you get a, a number that looks like this. So exactly the same to within error. So there is no difference between the scattering from, elect, from particles on the top of the specimen and the bottom of the specimen. So phew, physics is okay. Um, so, right, but will this actually be useful? Well, as I said, you know, we can bring this down to here, but in order to really get the full benefit of this, because we've sort of de decohered the beam by going through the specimen, we really would like to work without defocus so that there is no, there is no differential there and we don't have to lose that much um, information. So what do we need to work in focus? Well, we need a phase plate, right? Um, and phase plates have also been around in the electron microscopy field for a very long time. This is one of the early ones that worked um, from Nigel Unwin in our lab back from 1970. It's a wonderful story of how this phase plate was constructed. Uh, so I encourage you to read the paper um, if you haven't. This is uh, a spider web um, which has been coated in carbon which was used to generate the electrostatic potential and then shift the phase um, way back in 1970 and it worked. Um, but of course, you know, it, there were lots of problems with this and many other phase plates that make them not very practical for sort of the proper data collection that we want to do these days in single particle and in tomography. So now one of the most promising new um, uh, designs of phase plates uh, is happening at Berkeley and we have Petar here who's going to give a talk about this later. So we're also very excited about this. But if you were to combine that phase plate technology with CC correction technology, the potential benefit is very significant now. Um, I mean, phase plates are good in and of themselves um, because they can bring back signal in regions where we've lost it in, in many ways. But the, we're particularly excited about the combination of these things in the context of imaging thick specimen because then you push this curve significantly farther down. Um, and if we were able to actually do the same, you know, radiation damage that I talked about earlier in single particle, radiation damage in, in thick specimens and tomography is exactly the same. So there's no reason why adding liquid helium and lower temperatures, again, as long as we can work out the details of the problems, wouldn't also give us a significant benefit. Um, and that would then bring us down to numbers that are really quite exciting, in my opinion. You know, sub 100 kilodalton proteins identified in, you know, half micron thick specimens. And we are nowhere near that right now, I think. But, um, you know, if, if all of these technologies can be brought to fruition, maybe we could be in, in, in some time soon. So, and then if you took one of those, you know, beautiful tomograms, maybe you could see all the rhodopsins inside there. Right, so here is my sort of wish list for, a, for an in situ microscope. It's a rough list, so don't, you know, don't quote me too hard on this, okay? But, you know, I think 300 kV is reasonable energy. You don't want 100 kV for this, probably, right? Because th there is a significant difference, um, uh, you know, in the potential uh, signal that you can get um, using these electrons. But on the other hand, uh, there's not a huge benefit in going to significantly higher energies. So if you go up to 600 kV, you get a few percent more, but the trade-off there does become sort of in the diminishing returns because it gets much harder to make phase plates, I think. It gets much, much, much harder to make CC correctors because you're in this super relativistic regime and, um, you know, and you need big, huge microscopes with bunkers and things like this. So everything gets much harder as you go above. So probably three, 400 kV is going to be um, what we want. Um, the specimen temperature, this we need to, we still, as I said, need to in investigate more. If we can unlock the potential of this reduction in radiation damage, then we certainly will want it. Um, and, but yet the, the one question we don't have yet is how low is low enough? So we are gonna, we are gonna work on this as well to say, you know, is it, is it enough to go to sort of 13, 14 K, which is what the Polaras and previous generation of microscopes could do? Or is it, do we really need to go right down to four Kelvin or even lower one, two Kelvin, right? So these are all possible, but 
we have to know whether there's, there's real benefit in doing it. Um, and CC correction and phase plates, as I said. Um, and then, of course, we want a bigger and better and faster detector. There's no reason why these can't continue to get better. We're still significant, you know, several generations back from, you know, the phone that's in my pocket in terms of, you know, technology. Um, so I think, you know, the next generation will be probably 65 nanometer technology, but it can keep going well beyond that. So, um, and, you know, and this, I think this we really can't lose sight of in the con even without any changes in the microscope. We really do need a way of making perfect 2000 angstrom sections from any frozen cellular specimen without these damaged layers on the, on the top and the bottom that are, that are costing us contrast. Okay, that's it. I'm going to stop there. This is my, um, my little group in Cambridge. Um, and uh, I'm going to point out a few people in particular for this. So Katerina, who's going to give a talk later. Um, this is Josh Dickerson, PhD student with me. He did all these um, theoretical and experimental um, verifications of, uh, you know, how this, um, how, you know, the potential of these inelastic electrons. And that was started in conjunction with a master student, um, Dylan, who was um, in the physics uh, program in Cambridge. And then this is um, uh, Richard and Greg McMullen, who's really the the real um, key to the whole 100 kV project and hacking all these detectors and many other things. And then this is Archie Howie here standing in front of our little 100 kV microscope. And I'll stop there and um, take questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>